So we'll get into the news just a tidbit here at the beginning, and then uh, and then I'm going to get into the meat of this video. This is a video that I've very unusual video for me. I suggest that uh, once we get past the visual portion here, just uh, next time you're doing dishes or like I do, I'll be out you know vacuuming or working around the house. Just put this on audio and just listen to it. It's uh, to be more or less like just cutting the radio on and uh, listening to the um, Colonel Douglas McGregor, and then that's going to be the whole video for the day. Um, but I'll, I'll just get into the news briefly. Um, I guess the most significant thing that I saw was the Russians hit a, uh, well, I want to say a conference center, um, and I guess there was a lot of, uh, a lot of NATO officers in there. Uh, 60 are dead. Uh, I think there's 110 casualties. Uh, of course, that includes the dead. So, uh, then helicopters or, or NATO uh, uh, air ambulances going back and forth, uh, pulling pulling out the uh, the NATO officers. Of course, the Ukraine uh, side of that story is that uh, that was a civilian complex, and uh, I guess the civilians are being evacuated to NATO countries. <laughs> You know, it's so absurd what the Ukrainians put out. I wish I could report on what the Ukrainians say, because, but it's it's just too absurd to report on. Uh, what was, uh, was there anything else that uh, I thought was of significance? Um, oh, yeah, the next video. Uh, I, and it's been, it's been too depressing for me. I just haven't been able to make it, um, because I got into um, the monuments. I wanted to talk about how we're erasing our history. And I got into it, and I was been capturing all of these these videos about monuments being torn down all over the world. But I guess the one that, that shocked me the most was uh, Richmond, because I walked down Monument Avenue, and it was beautiful. It used to be a beautiful place, and uh, and they tore all the monuments down. Um, anyway, that's that'll be the next video. All right, well let's just uh, let's just get into Colonel Douglas McGregor and. As a lead up to this video, you know, God puts people on this planet for a reason, in my opinion. And uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor is one of those people. Uh, he is uh, profoundly intelligent. Uh, if he was our joint uh, chief, you know, our joint chief in charge of the military, I dare say this country would be a different place right now, as he was under Donald Trump briefly. Um, and he does talk about Donald Trump in the video. Uh, good, good compliments. Uh, tells you, you know, we were heading in the right direction on a lot of these things before the, uh, and I want to call it a coup. I, I don't think that election was real by any sense. I think it was stolen. I agree with Donald Trump. Now, I guess that means that <laughs> maybe, maybe that, oh, that was the other thing in the news. Um, the uh, prosecutor, there's been a bill put forward in the uh, Georgia legislature to have that prosecutor removed that's trying to charge uh, Donald Trump with, uh, what is it called, sedition, I think is what one of the charges. Uh, of course, he's got, uh, and we'll see where that goes. It was only two people that proposed it. They're, they would have to come back in session. And then, of course, you've got that neocon uh, Democrat in charge of, um, and I call him a Democrat, Rhino, uh, in charge of, you know, Kemp. Uh, I don't think he's, I don't think he'd sign the bill, but who knows, you know. I don't know, the Georgians seem to like him for, for some weird reason, I I wouldn't want him as my governor, I can tell you that. Well, let's just get into the video. Enjoy. And by the way, like I said, just put it on audio and, and listen to what Colonel Douglas McGregor has to say. Probably one of the most profound speeches of, of my lifetime. Peace out. Stay free. Progosian, a well-known restaurateur in Moscow, found himself in a unique position. He was not merely a businessman, but a man with connections to powerful figures like Lukashenko, Bill Russia, and even Vladimir Putin. While the nature of his relationship with Putin was ambiguous, there was no denying his influence within Russia's ruling elite. Progozhin envisioned something beyond his restaurants, an organization operating as a special operations force, able to train or execute missions overseas for Russia. This concept, though audacious, resonated with Russia's military strategy and mirrored its existing use of special forces. Russia's laws allowed uh, uh, private military organizations like Wagner to operate beyond the nation's borders. Wagner, under Prigozhin's direction, was to function like the French Foreign Legion, 
serving outside Russia except in extreme emergencies. Then the unexpected happened in Ukraine. President Putin had sent a small force to signal his seriousness, anticipating prompt talks. But the opposite occurred and the situation escalated. Prigozhin seized the opportunity, building a force, nearly 25,000 strong. They went into Ukraine and performed impressively, gaining a reputation as the musicians by the Ukrainians and Polish forces. Wagner's effectiveness was beyond question. Our tensions arose. Progoshin felt under-recognized and under-supported by figures like Gerasimov and the defense minister Shogu. A personal feud developed, but Progoshin also recognized that his message struck a chord with the Russian public. He began to vocalize a desire to see the war fought more effectively and brought to a decisive end. The Russian population seemed to connect with Progoshin's vision. His words seemed to transcend mere military strategy, resonating with a broader sentiment within the nation. Over time, Progozhin became increasingly frustrated with what he saw as inadequate support and recognition. He felt his force deserved more and he grew openly critical of Russia's military leadership. This discord led to a public feud with figures like Gerasimov and Shulbu. In the end, Progozhin's story is one of ambition, opportunity, and influence. From his roots as a restaurateur to his role in shaping Russia's military strategy, he became a significant figure within Russia's complex political and military landscape. His leadership of Wagner, his advocacy for decisive action, and his connection with the public make his tale an engaging chapter in contemporary Russian history. Progozhin's vision, determination, and influence present a narrative rich with complexity and insight. His story offers a glimpse into the interplay of power, politics, and strategy within Russia, revealing a man who bridged the worlds of business and warfare, a man whose decisions and actions continue to impact the unfolding situation in Ukraine. Evgeny Prigozhin, leader of the private military organization Wagner, found himself at odds with other figures in the Russian government. Frustrated and feeling ignored, he decided to take drastic action to get President Putin's attention. Prigozhin's forces were sitting in reserve, and he moved them down to Rostov, then put the three or four thousand of them on the road to Moscow. This move was initially perceived as a threat designed to unseat Putin, an impossibility, of course. Progoshin had no intention of unseating Putin. He merely wanted to get rid of Gerasimov and Shogu, and most importantly, to have his concerns heard. However, the situation escalated quickly. As soon as Putin made it clear that he wouldn't tolerate Progoshin's actions, a clash ensued between Wagner and the Russian Air Force, resulting in 12 Russian casualties. Deeply regretting the incident, Prigozhin immediately ordered a cease to all operations. The tension led to a private meeting between Prigozhin and Putin, along with 34 of Prigozhin's officers. In this lengthy three-hour discussion, they seemed to iron out their differences. The meeting underscored Wagner's effectiveness as a military organization, particularly skilled in urban operations and essential to Russia's interests. There was never a threat to Putin's power nor was Progozhin ever in danger of imprisonment or execution. Contrary to some Western beliefs, much of this was driven by wishful thinking fueled by so-called Russian experts who were more interested in promoting their negative views of Russia. The reality is that the Russian army has undergone a dramatic transformation, expanding from just over 200,000 to up to 750,000. Quiet mobilizations continue to occur, drawing individuals from colleges, universities, and technical institutes into the reserves. Despite claims that the Russians would run out of ammunition or lack sustainability, the quality and capability of the armed forces have risen dramatically. In St. Petersburg, Progozhin continues to be active, with accommodations for Wagner being built in Belarus and Luhansk. The situation has stabilized, but the recent events have shed light on the complexities and dynamics within Russia's political and military landscape. The story of Progozhin's actions and the subsequent resolution offers a nuanced perspective on Russia's current state. It reveals the layers of power, ambition, and strategy that shape the nation's decisions and its relations with the rest of the world. It's a tale that serves as a cautionary reminder about distinguishing reality from wishful thinking, recognizing the strength and resilience that characterize Russia's present trajectory. Evgeny Progozhin's story is an intriguing one linking him to some of the most powerful figures in Russia.
As a man who built his reputation as a restorer in Moscow, Prigozhin soon found himself in a close personal relationship with both Lukashenko and Bill Russia and even Putin. His ambition didn't stop at building an organization to go overseas. He wanted to create something akin to a special operations forces entity. It would train or execute missions overseas for the Russians, similar to how other nations use their special forces. But Progoshin's plans were not without controversy. Russian laws were clear. Private military organizations like Wagner could operate anywhere except within Russia's borders. These laws likened these groups to the French Foreign Legion, meant to be stationed outside of their homeland except in extreme emergencies. The war in Ukraine was unanticipated even by President Putin. Prigozhin's force of almost 25,000 moved in and they performed brilliantly. The Ukrainians and Polish forces referred to the Wagner troops as the musicians and they were indeed effective. But Prigozhin's anger grew, feeling his force was not getting enough recognition or support. Tensions escalated, culminating in Prigozhin's decision to move his forces to Moscow to get Putin's attention. While some perceived this as a threat, it was nothing more than an attempt to communicate and rectify differences within the ruling elite. After a private meeting with Putin, the differences seemed ironed out. As the story unfolds, we glimpse the Russian strength and resilience. Contrary to the many misconceptions and disinformation spread about their incompetence or unwillingness to fight, the Russian army had grown and mobilized dramatically. Uh, this narrative also touches on the international implications of the conflict including the potential famines breaking out in various places of the world due to the war's impact on food supplies. The latter part of the story brings into focus President Trump's views on Ukraine and Taiwan. He believed he could stop the Ukraine conflict in 24 hours and saw Taiwan as a place not worth defending but essential for its microcircuitry production. In this tapestry of political intrigue, military ambition, international relations, and personal feuds, Progosian's story offers a unique window into the complexities of modern Russia and its impact on the global stage. It's a tale that weaves together power, ambition, strategy, and the human elements that drive them all. At the heart of a delicate web of political and economic interests lies Taiwan, a small island nation with a rich history and an uncertain future. Its significance goes beyond its shores and it finds itself caught in a global tug of war. During President Trump's tenure, the idea of installing a, a factory in Arizona was on the cards. This wasn't just any factory, but one connected to Taiwan's production of sensitive microcircuitry. Aware of its importance, Trump's drive to forge a path to self-reliance. While the political climate pointed to a looming Chinese military assault on Taiwan, the evidence remained elusive. The Chinese um, formidable power were also pragmatic. They understood that a mere 100 miles of water separated them from Taiwan and a direct assault would alienate Asian support. But why resort to war when political leverage existed within Taiwan itself? Taiwan's political landscape was divided between two major parties. One was pro-Japanese and had been actively seeking U.S. support. The other, the KMT, was Shanghai Shek's old party, the pro-Beijing entity. Shanghai Shek was a historical figure who had led his nationalist forces to Taiwan after losing the war with the communists. Both parties represented a larger Chinese desire to create a society mirroring Singapore. For Americans unfamiliar with Asia, this could seem alarming. Singapore's government-controlled structure, married to a pure capitalist force, could be both intriguing and terrifying. But for the Chinese in Taiwan and the mainland, this Confucianism-rooted concept was agreeable. President Xi's timeline of 2047 for reunification wasn't an arbitrary choice, but uh, a carefully thought out plan. It was built on the assumption that China and Taiwan would grow more closely aligned. An interesting anecdote sheds light on the intertwined economic interest. During a war game in the early part of this century, Chinese bankers in Taiwan moved their holdings to the mainland for safety during a crisis and then moved them back when stability returned. The story moves us to question what is the true nature of these political dances? Is it nonsensical to even consider going to war with China over Taiwan? The Koreans' disinterest in the matter underlines regional complexities. But sitting across from North Korea, a dying state and a regional hazard, they have their concerns and priorities. A Taiwan story is not merely a tale of an island nation. 
but a microcosm of larger geopolitical forces. Its history, politics, economic interests, and relations with both allies and foes weave a complex narrative that reflects the multiplicity of interest in the Asia-Pacific region. The delicate dance of power and pragmatism resonates far beyond its shores, offering a nuanced perspective on global relations in the 21st century. Japan and China, two mighty nations with centuries-old histories, now find themselves locked in an economic embrace. The notion of these two going to war seems almost unimaginable. Japan's investments in China, the factories being built, and production facilities signal a future defined by cooperation rather than confrontation. China, uh, under President Xi, has taken unprecedented steps, opening its markets to Japan in a way that had never been done before. The flow of goods from food to critical items reflects a mutual dependency. A war between these two giants would be catastrophic, both economically and politically. Frankly speaking, a war seems unlikely unless provoked from the outside. His perspective was shared by former President Donald Trump, and as some argue, possibly Robert F. Kennedy Jr. They view China not as an immediate existential military threat, but as a challenge that can be managed without resorting to war. Trump's administration sought to level the playing field through negotiations. A Lighthouser's role in trade, talks with the Chinese, was seen as a beacon of diplomatic success. Had the United States stayed on that track, the outcome might have been different. But there's another aspect that lurks in the shadows. Oh, the United States has been paying no attention to Chinese individuals within its borders, in universities, laboratories, and the industrial base. Thousands of Chinese men are entering the United States daily, some possibly escaping prosecution at home. The reasons behind this influx are varied. Some speculate that many were caught up in China's shadow banking system, which President Xi has severely cracked down on. Xi's battle against corruption within China's vast population of 1.4 billion is well known. Would he want any further trouble outside his borders? Of course not. The very idea seems insane. But yet the problem runs deeper within the United States. There's a sense that the rule of law is no longer as strictly upheld. If you were to speak to anyone who has come to the United States in the last 50 years, they might have their own stories to tell, each reflecting a complex reality. The narrative that unfolds is intricate, touching on the interlocking interests of Japan and China, Trump's policies, the unnoticed influx of immigrants, and concerns over law and governance. The situation is filled with nuance and complexity. We are presented with a world where global politics, trade, and national interests blend into a multifaceted tapestry. The dance of diplomacy continues, guided by leaders who seek to maintain stability, foster growth, and preserve integrity. The path forward demands not just attention to immediate concerns, but also a profound understanding of the undercurrents that shape our shared destiny. In this global stage, decisions ripple across borders, influencing lives in the course of nations. Understanding these dynamics is not only essential for leaders, but also for the citizens of this interconnected world. The glow of the American dream, the land of opportunity, beckons many across the world. It's not just the promise of prosperity that lures them, but the uh, adherence to the rule of law. Oh, I came here because this is a great place to do business. In my country, you have to bribe everybody, a recent immigrant might tell you. But that glistening image of America is under threat. While corruption remains virtually ubiquitous in parts of the world, Say for most of Northern Europe, North America, and some regions in Asia, the United States is facing a crisis. It's beginning to mirror the very problems that have driven people to its shores. And uh, this issue doesn't need to exist. But what do the American people know about Ukraine? One might ask, it's a distant land for many, yet the nation teeters dangerously close to being pulled into a conflict there. Eyes turn to Vilnius, where supposed NATO allies Lithuania and Poland are contemplating sending troops into western Ukraine. Such a move could awaken a sleeping bear. The Russians, viewing this as a Trojan horse for NATO, would undoubtedly react. An attack would be inevitable, leading to a different Russia emerging, one that's even more powerful, mobilizing on a national level for an all-out war. Who wants that? Who thinks it's necessary? Meanwhile, 300,000 Russian troops sit in reserve, waiting to pounce, their fates tied to the decisions made at the NATO summit. Belish and Belitermast 
you know, the real focus should be on domestic affairs. Commentators harp on demographic problems and other issues, but the immediate steps are clear, close the border, store the rule of law, and give those in the country illegally defined period, whether 60 or 90 days, to leave. If they register on the way out, the promise of considering them for legal entry in the future could be extended. If not, they would be treated as criminals. It's a drastic proposal, and the implementation would not be easy. Going into cities to enforce this policy would require more than the current police department's capabilities. America stands at a crossroads with complex international and domestic challenges. The nation's identity as a place of opportunity and fairness is being tested. Decisions made now will shape not only the immediate future, but the very essence of what America represents. Will cooler heads prevail in international relations? Will domestic policies reflect the values that have long defined the nation? Only time will tell, but the urgency of the situation requires thoughtful action and steadfast resolve. In the balance hangs not just the fate of a country, but the ideals that have drawn countless people to its shores in pursuit of a better life. A somber silence settled over the room as a question lingered in the air, a question no one wanted to ask but knew they must face. Are there areas where we will absolutely have to consider martial law in order to put an end to the violence and the criminality? It's a chilling prospect, invoking images of soldiers patrolling streets and the suspension of civil liberties, but it may be the case. It was a gathering of minds grappling with the very fabric of American society, unraveling at the seams the nation, once a beacon of freedom and opportunity, now faced challenges within its borders that seemed to eclipse everything else. The world's problems were suddenly distant, abstract concerns compared to the tangible fear that pervaded the room. Those present knew that these internal matters were existential. These weren't just hypothetical debates. These were questions that would determine the very future of the nation. Violence, criminality, and the erosion of trust in the rule of law threatened to undermine everything they held dear. All the geopolitical turmoil, all the international struggles suddenly paled in comparison. As one speaker put it, all of these things are far more important than anything happening anywhere beyond our borders today. If we don't address them, we could go under. It was a grim reality to face, but it was also a call to action. The choices that lay ahead were daunting and filled with uncertainty, but they were choices that needed to be made. Apathy or indecision was not an option. For a country that had always prided itself on its democratic principles, the idea of martial law was a severe and uncomfortable measure, but the urgency of the situation demanded a response. As the meeting adjourned, the weight of the conversation hung heavy in the room. There was no easy path forward, but there was a shared understanding that the time had come to act. The nation was at a tipping point, and the course it chose now would shape its destiny. The stakes had never been higher, and the need for courageous and resolute leadership had never been more acute. In the end, the ultimate question was not just about laws, policies, or military interventions. It was a question about identity and values. What kind of nation did they want to be? What were they willing to do to preserve the principles that had defined them? Only time would tell. But the urgency of the moment was clear. The path ahead was fraught with danger, but it was a path that had to be taken. America's very survival depended on it. Run on for a long time, run on for a long time, sooner or later God's gonna cut you down, sooner or later God's gonna cut you down, go tell that globalist liar, that democrat idiot writer, that rhino rambler, that nuclear war gambler, 
that backbiting U.S. politician. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down.